and suddenly I could hear things she was doing. She was playing Liszt and very difficult pieces that, uh, and with ease. She told me I could trill for 10 minutes. I'll never forget without ever getting tired, and that was very, very strange, you know. And the, the way to think of the trill also is it's helpful to think if you want to teach children, for example, that you really, it's the same as standing on both legs and shifting from one to the other. It's a shift. And I said that a very good example of the single rotation would be a trill. Because that's a single rotation. It's left, right, left, right. And the playing in one direction already, again, and going a little bit beyond gives you already the, the motion to go next to the next note. The important thing with that is that it has to be perfectly synchronized as you go faster and faster. The motion becomes smaller and smaller, and you don't see anything. It evolved. I, I, I did it well, and she started feeling comfortable with me. And she knew that I loved the work and I understood it very well. I started having very good results with students. Now, of course, how would we have the school if Edna hadn't taken over the lecturing? I dumped it in Edna's lap and I called her on the phone and I said, Edna, would you want to do the lecturing because I can't do it? She said, me? You know? No, I me? Said no. no, she said no. This is not something that is just a strange, weird, mysterious work. This is knowledge. And musicians are simply not used to the idea that there might be knowledge around to help them with their problems. It's a very strange idea, the same way that it was to me. Okay. Now what you're going to do is turn it this way. That's it. And when you come down on your second finger, bring your thumb close to your second finger. And, and the other fingers are going to be touching the keys. Now you're going to take your third finger and do the same thing. Good. Where's your fifth finger? Not right. You're not touching the keys. I can't. Oh, yes, you can. Play your third. Now, you're not going to lift from here. There'll be no lifting sensation whatsoever. Your arm is turning. You're doing nothing. And just throw it. Okay. Remember what you said to me before when I said, can you get your finger down? You said, I can't. Can you? Yes. All right. You know, the piano should become something loving to you. You should feel that I want to touch it all the time. That's very important. You work with her, Edna, every day just to get her to do this. By the time she leaves here, that will be solved. To about here with a second and to about here with a third, okay? Yeah. About here with a second. Perhaps the other aspect of it that right. made it so valid to me was the fact that I had wanted to do something where I did something for other people. And I felt that playing it's good, it's right. did not justify it's right. playing alone. It's good. Now, the, I wanted to say something about exercises in general. And it was James who said on instrumental study, and I quote, but singling out basic forms is not solving the technical problems connected with them. Not one of the etude writers says a word about the dear deadly question of how the thing is done. End of quote. getting my doctorate in Juilliard. I saw her for the first time because I was accompanying a roommate who wanted to study with her, and I just came along for the ride. And after I saw her solve a problem for her that she had I had heard her struggle with for months and months without being able to solve, uh, on a lark, I went over to the piano and I asked her, would you help me with something? And she said, certainly. And I showed her, uh, as the uh, Chopin etude, the Opus 10 number one, which involves a lot of arpeggiated patterns uh, and the use of a fourth finger, which always got stuck and I could not articulate. And I would say within 30 seconds, she had me playing the piece effortlessly and I was just sitting there dumbfounded because I just couldn't believe that that was possible. I, I used to struggle and struggle with stretching and pulling and couldn't get it. And here was, a simple approach of, not, of moving to the fourth finger, which made it feel as strong as all the other fingers. And in all the years that I had been playing the piano, that was a totally new sensation for me. There is no limitation in the flexion ability of the fourth finger, only in the lifting. But the piano is not up, the piano is down below. Thank God.
among the many teachers I've had, there was one who suggested I do this incredible exercise, strangely enough, an exercise by Brahms, where you hold down two notes silently, and then you have to do these incredible contortions, where you, it's, I remember specifically, it's number 19 from Brahms 51 exercise, where you do this sort of thing, you know, and it's, it's a to total um, isolation of these motions, and the idea behind the exercise, I guess, is to put your arms through as great a pain as possible. Um, I went through one exercise phase where I, I did every etude or book of exercise I could get my hands on, such as Dokhnani and Pishna and Cherny, you name it. And, I, and um, I thought that at the end of the day when my arms were exhausted, wow, I must really be getting somewhere. When you're being told that pulling and stretching your fingers, got to stretch your hand, when tests have been made, Ortman's book show that they made tests for years, where the fourth finger was pulled and stretched, and it didn't change one bit and they're still pulling and stretching the fourth finger. And there's nothing wrong with the fourth finger. They're being told that because there's a ligament that crosses from the fifth to the third finger, and the fourth finger cannot lift as high as the other fingers, and therefore that's an impediment. So they're pulling. You know, Schumann put a string from the ceiling to the finger and pulled it and crippled it. Well, they're still doing it without strings. What they haven't realized is we never play the piano that way. Instead of lifting a finger away, we can lift all the fingers away and drop each finger individually. There's no tissue on the bottom that prevents you from dropping with power away from the rest of the hand. So that if you turn the technique around, there's no problem with the fourth finger. I had just graduated from Harvard in uh, June of 84. And I had auditioned for Juilliard and some, by some miracle gotten in, even though I basically had not been able to practice. The only way I could barely squeak, I could barely play at all was um, after I played, my arms would be, in ex both arms incidentally, began to hurt. I would put ice in them and rub the ice on for like 10 minutes. And I went to many doctors and I got many diagnoses. Um, some said I had um, tendonitis of, at the insertion of the lateral epicondyle. Um, so they said, if you have tendonitis, um, we may have to try a cortisone injection, or if that doesn't work, you may actually have to have surgery. Before I met Mrs. Taubman, I tried almost everything the medical world offered, um, including ultrasound, um, lots of drugs, baclofen, naproxen. I tried acupuncture even. I had traction, I had massage, I had um, hot and cold treatments. Um, I went to a clinic for sports medicine. The first thing they did, they sat me down in this tub of cold water, which was 34 degrees, and they made me put both arms in the cold water for five minutes, and that was absolutely the most painful experience I've ever had in my life. Then I walk out with these icicles for arms, and they sit me down on the table, and this woman starts, takes her thumbs and she starts digging me into my elbow. I'm just going like this. I go, Jesus. It was very, very a painful year, basically the year 1984. Um, I met Mrs. Taubman in, or I auditioned for Mrs. Taubman in early June of 84, and she said she would accept me the following year. I went into her studio, and she says, put your hand, she says, okay, you know, put your hand on the keyboard. So I put the hand on my keyboard, and instantly my fingers clenched up into the old method, which is what I was taught. She says, there's no reason to clench your fingers like that. Just simply drop your arm and then just set your hand on the keyboard in the normal, the normal hand position that, that your hand would fall naturally if it were by your side. I said, hmm, that makes sense. Why didn't anyone tell me that? Um, then um, then we, we began just the five finger exercise where we do the initial um, rotation on the thumb. Um, then what happened? Uh, and then after that she taught me the scale about how um, the so-called thumb under is totally incorrect. You shouldn't put your thumb under because the minute you put your thumb under, you're tying up all these tendons on the top of the hand. Um, and then, then we took up a Mozart concerto. Um, and she just had me do the 16th note runs through the piece, um, very slowly, note by note, every rotation you know, as perfectly timed as possible. After six weeks of very slow, careful work, um, I was able to take on basically any piece I wanted. And now I'm, I'm able to play the Rachmaninoff third without too much trouble. <laughs> I 
never wanted to teach. I was only interested in performing. I could never conceive of myself as, as teaching except if I had to make a living. By the time my husband came home from World War II and he said to me, well, now you can quit your teaching and you can go back to your own performing. I said, I can't. He said, what do you mean? I said, I, I'm into something so spectacular and so important. It can't be just for myself. You have to realize that my generation was very socially oriented. They came out of a deep depression and there was a tremendous amount of liberalism and a feeling of, of helping mankind. And it would be inconceivable for me to have found something at that time and felt I had a right to keep it to myself. And Enid came to visit me in Beckett when I was in the country. And she said to me, I'm gonna build you a school. I said, it's impossible, schools are failing all over the place. How do you do that? She said, well, let's start with a seminar of some kind, a two week session. And Amherst was such a gorgeous place, such, so perfect for our needs. And so we came here and here we are. I had graduated from Juilliard, and uh, I went to a competition, a fairly important international competition, and I won. And that was the first time that I really became aware that I was already a pianist. And I was here at Marlboro for the summer in 1976, and I met one of her students, and at that time, I was not happy with my playing, and I had some physical difficulties. Besides tension, which I wasn't aware of as being a problem at that point, I was having some pain in one of my fingers. And, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that doctors will tell you you have to be operated on, or you have arthritis, and you, you shouldn't play the piano anymore. It was not keeping me from playing, but it was, it was, I was concerned about it. I didn't know what it was. Uh, I didn't have the idea that it was from my playing exactly, but when I mentioned it to this other student, she said, oh, well, my teacher can clear that up in you know, two lessons, as she did. I just want to ask you, so you played it beautifully. When you first started, you missed some of the top notes. Is that only, does that happen occasionally? Uh -huh. All right. Now, interesting, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that there's necessarily anything technical there, but rather musical. If you treated it more like a theme and variations, I don't think you would have missed it. Now, if you will play that and think that what you want your audience to hear is yum, bum, bum, bum. Now, now play it and see if you have a problem. No, you see, the reason, let me show you why you have the problem. You're still playing.